This is the Tom Hartman Program. And welcome back to Media for the Rest of Us, the Tom Hartman Program, with me in the studio. I'm really pleased to have Kevin Camps, the nuclear watchdog Nuclear Waste Watchdog at Beyond Nuclear, beyondnuclear.org. Hey, Kevin, welcome. Thanks, Tom. Thanks glad, for having me. Glad to have you with us. So today is the fourth anniversary of the Fukushima meltdown. What's the status of Fukushima right now? Well, I like to start with a little good news because it's so rare. They finally managed to get the high-level radioactive waste out of the Unit 4 pool. That was in December, and mm -hmm. that was a very precarious situation. The building was on the brink of collapse the pool could have caught on fire if that had happened with the drain down of the cooling water. That's that, the one where it was like pulling cigarettes out of a crushed pack. I mean, that's yes. amazing that they did it. That's the good news. It took them four years to do that. They had to rebuild the structure of the building to support the crane and then do the work. But there's three other high-level radioactive waste storage pools in destroyed buildings there. You've got units one, two, and three that suffered the meltdowns. Right. And those pools still have the waste in them. And Unit 3 is the most precarious. It's full of 50 tons of debris that rained down after the large-scale explosion. And incredibly, Tokyo Electric managed to drop a heavy piece of equipment accidentally into the pool relatively recently. So the damage to that fuel in Unit 3 is currently unknown. It could be much more difficult than the Unit 4 operation. And those pools, too, are, are vulnerable to a large earthquake that drains their cooling water. We're not out of the woods, even with the high-level waste. And then, right. of course, the melted cores are still missing in action. Nobody knows exactly where they are. Are they within damaged containment? Are they sitting in the groundwater? Nobody knows. Nobody wow. can say. How, how much radiation have Japanese and Americans been exposed to as a consequence of this? Well, there's big-picture numbers, like... 700 petabecquerels. That's a lot of zeros. That's mm. how much has gotten out. But the thing is, you have to add to that every day because there's still a flow every day on a good day, so to speak, of 300 tons of radioactively contaminated groundwater going into the ocean. But there are many bad days. And it turns out that there, there were many bad days that Tokyo Electric kept quiet for the last 10 months. Just in the last week or two, admitting that highly radioactive water was flowing down drainage ditches. They finally figured out what's going on. They just didn't tell people about it for 10 months. That was going directly into the ocean. Wow. And just yesterday, another big spill, because some days are very bad, and they have very big spills. Mm -hmm. This spill was 747 tons of highly radioactive rainwater overflow leaking through drainage systems they've built that are shoddily built and leaking, apparently, so they lost a lot of water overnight. It was visible, and they did the math, and they figured it was close to 750 tons of rainwater containing levels of radioactivity measured in the thousands of becquerels per liter. So one becquerel is, you're talking about 700, did you say petabecquerels? Seven, it's yeah, 700? that's the so grand figure. For is a, is is a trillion, right? Uh, I think it's beyond that. It's It's 15 or 18 zeros. Wow. That's how much radioactivity was discharged so in the atmosphere. Like a thousand trillion. And you've got to add these daily and wow. bad day discharges into the ocean at and this point. And one becquerel would do what to a human being? Well, it's a radioactive disintegration per second, which goes on each second. You know, and it right. depends on the isotope. Cesium is hazardous for 300 to 600 years. That's how long it's decaying. Others much longer than that. Right. So every single becquerel, every single radioactive disintegration carries... The potential for initiating a cancer or a genetic defect, chances are it won't because these are microscopic uh, energy right. emissions. But when you start having billions and trillions and quadrillions and, and keep and, going. And all it takes is actually one. It only Just takes one, one technically. The National Academy of Sciences in the United States has affirmed for decades in these reports called biological effects of ionizing radioactivity that any exposure to radioactivity, no matter how low the dose, carries a health risk for cancer. Right. The higher the dose, the higher the risk. And these, these risks accumulate over a lifetime. There is no such thing as safe radiation exposure, even a dental x-ray. There's, There's no, such no thing safe as threshold. Safe. There's no safe threshold, period. We're talking with Kevin Camps, the uh, nuclear waste watchdog at Beyond Nuclear. Beyondnuclear.org is the website. Kevin, is it, is it possible that the strategy of the Japanese government with regard to Fukushima is just let the rain keep coming? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm thinking high-level high rainwater. What that means is that that rainwater is carrying bits of core with it, of, 
a disintegrated, blown up, melted out, whatever core. And that if they keep dumping enough of this high level stuff, every time they do it, you know, it's sort of like licking the ice cream cone, you know, eventually there's no ice cream cone left. Eventually it'll all wash away into the ocean. Is that their strategy? Well, I think these are accidents, incompetence. There are cover-ups going on. They don't like to admit what's going on until they have to when it's convenient for them for whatever reason, public relations wise. But I think more to your point is there is an ultimate strategy that's endorsed by the central government of the Abe administration, the nuclear regulation authority, Tokyo electric. They even have American advisors in there, former department of energy officials, former nuclear regulatory commission chairman from the United States getting paid by TEPCO to tell everybody, including the fisheries that it's okay for us to dump these hundreds of thousands of tons of stored water. I mean, they are storing highly radioactive water, hoping to filter it. The filters haven't worked in years. They're saying they can do it. They'll get it done. And then once they filtered out 60 or so of the radioactive poisons out of the 200 or so that are in this water, then they will release it to the ocean. So that means there's going to be over 100 radioactive substances in the water, including tritium, radioactive hydrogen, which to my knowledge is not filterable at right. this industrial this is, scale. This is like, that, that's one of the smallest particles in creation. It's hydrogen, I mean, it's yeah. radioactive itself, yeah. and they don't have filters for it, at least not outside of a laboratory setting right. that I know of. Right. This is, this, is, this is pretty astonishing. It's pretty awful, too. Um, what, what do we do? What, what does this mean? Well, actually, let me back up a little bit. Is there any radiation monitoring going on in Japan for people, for their food supply? I mean, do, do people, I mean, if Japan depends on fish. Fish live in the ocean. The ocean is being filled with radioactive material. Do the Japanese, are they getting irradiated? Do they know that they're getting irradiated? Do they know to level to which, or is this just a giant uncontrolled experiment and 40 years from now we'll be looking back and going, oh, look at that spike in birth defects. There is food monitoring going on. Whether it's adequate or not is another question. But, you know, compare the United States to Japan. Japan's legal limit for radioactivity in food is 100 becquerels per kilogram. That's radioactive cesium content, but it's used as a proxy for other radioactive poisons. Right. In the United States, our standard is 12 times weaker. We allow 1,200 becquerels per kilogram of radioactivity in our food. And what that means is food unfit for human consumption because of its radioactive contamination in Japan could be legally exported to the United States and sold on the open market. So they are unfortunately way ahead of us here in terms of radiation monitoring of their food supply. Ours is uh, pre-Fukushima at yeah. this point in terms yeah. of the seafood supply. We were, we were in a restaurant the other day with a friend who eats fish, and, and he just said to the, you know, it's not a problem for me. I'm vegan. <laughs> I avoid this stuff. But, you know, he said to the, to the waiter, um, where did this fish come from? And the waiter said, just a minute, I'll find out. And he came back and he said, it came from China, as far as we can tell. It was imported from Asia. I'm wondering if that came from Japan. Is Japan now a source of discount food because they can sell stuff here that they can't legally sell there? And are we being told if that's the case? It's legal for them to do that, unfortunately. And it's a huge dereliction of duty by the U.S. federal government. Our federal agency should be monitoring the food. Our food safety standards should be much stronger. So... We need to change that. We need to change it in Congress. We need to change it in the executive branch through public pressure. Wow. Wow. So 1,200 becquerels in a kilogram of, of, of food coming from Asia, that's 1,200 radioactive disintegrations per hour, per minute? Per second. Per second. Per second. Ongoing. So that's 1,200 opportunities to cause cancer every second. That, and that this food would be releasing for, depending on which radioactive isotope it is, months, years, decades, centuries. That's right. Astonishing. Kevin Camps, Beyond Nuclear is the website. Uh, the Nuclear Waste Watchdog of Beyond Nuclear. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you, Tom. Fourth anniversary of Fukushima. We'll be back.